Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, oh, yeah, it is on. I just wasn't sure. So Bob Rao is the brave guy to tackle the bell today. The bell and water. I noticed there was only just a few rings, though. <laughs> We're not going to go crazy on this day. It's good to see you back, Peg. How are you feeling? Good. <laughs> Consistency is the name of the game. I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, attending the forum that we had on Wednesday. It was a nice conversation, good conversation. <coughs> felt like what church should be. Just a chance to hear one another's stories, build community, to, to speak and to be heard. That was nice. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Don't know when that will be. We will keep you updated. Council will talk. We'll get a Get a topic in there, and we'll be back at it again. Uh, let's see here. I have no uh, particular updates other than, of course, the one that Peg gave us for our folks on our prayer list. We'll keep those going. In the back, very back pew, we have items there that are going to the back to school. What was the deadline? Deadline was today. We'll probably be taking them tomorrow, so if somebody had some more stuff, they can get a hold of me and before I get them over there tomorrow. Okay, thank you. So if you're having back to school items that either were left at home or we can, you can still get those in there. Hoping that we won't be having rain next Sunday because we'll be back at Turner Park for our outdoor worship service. And if it does rain, do you want to just stab it there? Or do you want to just call it? I'm not looking at Mary, because Mary's a little she's a tech person. Well, it depends on how, much... how hard it's raining. <laughs> okay, okay. If it's a light sprinkle, we will be there. Nothing in particular Can that I, I want to. Friends? Yes. On Friends Helping Friends is coming up.
with you. Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we, who cannot exist without you, may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us rise and join in our opening hymn, number 28. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Happy the people. He has chosen to be his own. The Lord looks down from heaven and beholds all the people in the world. From where he sits in the throne, he turns his gaze on all who dwell on the earth. He fashions all the hearts of them and understands all their works. There is no king that can be saved by a mighty army. A strong man is not delivered by his great strength. The horse is a vain hope for deliverance, for all its strength it cannot save. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him, on those who wait upon his love. To pluck their lives from death, to feed them in time of famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Indeed, our heart rejoices in him, for in his holy name we put our trust. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us as we have put our trust in you. Rainy day. There's no sun. There's no sun. 
Yes, there is. I, 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 it's, it's over. <laughs> um, the Old Testament reading today is from Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid. Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, Oh Lord, God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look towards the heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. The epistle today is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 and 8 through 16. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the world's were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised. As in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of creation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one is as good as death. Descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking only if they have been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city. Please rise for the gospel. The gospel is taken from Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, for an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Be dressed and ready for action, have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down and eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this. The owner of the house had known what hour the thief was coming. He would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. 
May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of the Holy Word. Let us pray. Loving and most merciful God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, for worship, for time together, and for the beginning of this week. We ask that you would continue to cultivate in us that desire to hear your word in a variety of ways and to respond, both in the context of conventional worship, but also in the everyday, as we just listen for your direction and your guidance on how to deal with situations as they pop up. So may the words of my mouth, the messages of our hearts, be acceptable to you, and may you always bless, keep, and guide us in your name. The Genesis passage and the Hebrews passage work together today. For the next few weeks, we will be moving through Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 brings us through the, the litany of faith heroes. You have to understand that Hebrews was written in order to bolster a community of faith that was in crisis. A community of faith that was starting to, as any community of faith does, get a little bit weary in what they're tasked to do come together and there's always excitement at the beginning of, of a new venture and as time unfolds and you say you know you long for more you, you get tired of the other people around there's disagreements misunderstandings so Hebrews is written in order to bolster this community of faith with a reminder of what it's all about and why we shouldn't get buried along the way in the 11th chapter comes this sort of litany of the honor roll of faith. The author goes back through the, the whole of, of Christendom, well, actually not even Christendom, but the Judeo-Christian context, and pulls back significant biblical characters to lift them up as role models, people that we should pay attention to and maybe dare to model ourselves after. This morning, we have Abram. He's known as Abram in, in the Genesis passage. And Abram was a man that was considered the great patriarch. He was going to be the father of a vast nation. But he was called by God to leave his homeland of Ur and go to this place, the land of Canaan, where God sent him. And he did. He packed up his household and his wife, Sarai, all the household servants and began to go and journey to this place where God says, I want you to go and settle, settle there. He brings his nephew Lot with him and off they go. He doesn't know where he's going, but he trusts that the Lord's leading will land him to the place where he needs to go. Now God had told Abram that he would have descendants and that his descendants would be vast like the grains of sand along, along the shoreline. But Abraham is of advanced years, his wife is of advanced years, and he's like, I don't know how this is going to happen. I, don't, I, don't, I think we left it a bit late, I don't think it's going to happen. So the passage that Bob read for us this morning is Abraham, Abram, recognizing that a slave has been born into his household, Eliezer, and he's thinking, perhaps maybe this is through my heir. I don't know how God is going to work, but maybe, maybe I just need to ask God if, if this if this slave that's born into my household is going to be the heir of my descendants, because otherwise I don't, I don't quite know how this is going to happen. So God invites Abram out into the night sky and asks him to look up and says, count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be. And it will not be the slave born into your household, but it will be your very own issue. This will be a child, you and your wife. And Abraham believes that. Verse 6, and it says he believed it and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now it's the result of this response that the author of Hebrews picks up on what Abram did. That Abram believed what was told to him. Even though Abram was doing the math, he was looking at his ears, he was looking at the ears of his wife. And there was no conceivable way that he could see how he could get an heir given his advanced age. But when God said, you look at those stars and count them if you can, and I assure you that your descendants will be as vast as the stars in this night sky, just Abram believing that immediately moved him to the top of the list of the heroes of faith. And 
the author of Hebrews wants to lay this example before their congregation to let them know there's always a bigger, larger plan at work, and there's a promise that's been made to us by God. And if we accept that promise, then our response, like Abraham, is to live into that promise. Now, what does that mean for Abraham to live into that promise? Abraham's no fool. He knows that having children is young people's work. I mean, the ability to have them and the ability to raise them, we know that that's, that's young people's work. And then you get the spoils when you're a grandparent. You get to watch your kids slog through, and you're like, ah, get on you. That's right. I've been there. But Abraham is of advanced years. By the time the call came to Abraham, he was already in his 70s. And, and his wife laughed when God said that they would have a child. When God established that covenant with Abraham and said, you will have vast descendants and it will be your own child. I'm not going to pull a fast one. Abraham and Sarah, can now call them that, have to live into the promise, which means God says, I assured you that you would have a descendant, but you got to do the work. I'm not going to do everything for you. Which means Abraham and Sarah have to suspend what they think they know about their advanced years and the way their bodies work, and they have to trust that God knows what he's doing. And Abraham, uh, in Hebrews, it even says that Abram and Sarah were given the gift of procreation. That God restored and renewed their bodies in order that they might be able to, in their advanced years, bring forth that child which would set in motion an entire generation of individuals that would be known as God's people. So first of all, by believing, by Abram believing, looking at that night sky, and not knowing how he can get from where he's at to that night sky. But by believing that, he anchored himself to a promise. He anchored himself to a promise of God because when God makes a promise to you, it is best for us to anchor ourselves to that promise. To not know when it's going to unfold, but to trust that it will. And to be assured that at some time, if we stay the course, this thing will come to pass. That's why faith is not some instantaneous thing. It's not like going to the microwave oven and hitting six minutes and, and then, you know, at the end of six minutes you'll have, you'll have renowned faith. It is a process. It takes time. There's going to be a lot of hits and misses in there, but we are not to veer off of the path. If Abraham got weary, chucked it in, called it all for naught, the story would read very differently. <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's, that's all I know. All I know is the story would read very differently. I can't envision my way around that because Abraham stayed with the promise. He lived into it. He brought his wife into that. And as a result, Isaac was the result of them trusting in that promise. But also, when we attach ourselves to the promise that God makes of us, that things will be okay, that there's a place prepared for us, it helps to move us forward because faith is about progressing and moving forward. It's not a one-off. It's not like saying I believe and then going redundant. It's saying you believe and then continuing to let your life be a reflection of the thing that you stake your beliefs on. Jesus left his disciples with a mandate that says they will know if you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. He was very clear about that. This was the night when he went and washed his disciples' feet and says, Do you know what I have done for you? I have served you. If I, your teacher and master, have served you, so you ought to serve one another. So it's not enough for us to say yes as people of faith we love without the exhibition of the love, without the promotion of the love, without the service that comes as a result of the proclamation. The promise is, is that God has created us a people of love, has created us a people of service, has created us as peacemakers and peace bringers. But if we do not bring the peace, if we do not desire to create and establish the peace, if we do not promote the harmony, we are flouting the promise because we are not living into the promise. We are not conducting ourselves with the sort of attitude and the frame of mind that says, we believe this. So Abraham is wonderful to, to as an example of being able to be faced with an impossible odd, incredible odds, 
yet he still trusts. He still leans in closer. He does not lose heart. He allows God's plan to unfold even though he himself cannot see it. But his trust was so resolute that it came to pass. And I'm racing ahead a little bit, but just to tell you the story, it's a Genesis story. But even when Isaac was born, then God's like, okay, I need you to go up the mountain and sacrifice the, the young lad. And Abraham's like, no. <laughs> come on, God. I mean, first of all, this, this, was, this child was hard won. Now you want me to go up the mountain and sacrifice him. But when, but God was this cruel and unusual test. But Abraham took the child up the mountain. And just as he was about ready to, you know, fasten the kid to an altar. And just as he was about ready to, to sacrifice his son, because God told him to do it, there was a ram that was caught in the thicket there that the Lord had provided. Now, this submitting to, to God's will might ask us to do extreme things. And maybe the extreme thing that we were being asked to do is to forgive those who persecute us, to love our presumed enemies. To lean into some understanding of a group of individuals or a circumstance that we ourselves would never normally consider if we were just operating on our own operation. But when God asks us to trust that there's a new thing that will spring forth, if only we loosen our grip enough to allow God to lead us into these new spaces, that's when the wisdom springs forth. That's when we are able to recognize that the promise is a lot bigger than we had envisioned. Verses 13 through 16 of the Hebrews passage says this, All of these died in faith without having received the promises. But from a distance, they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on earth, for people who speak this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. This is very important. People are, these, these individuals and partners of faith are speaking about an existence that is one that is rich with blessings of God, the unity, the love, the community. Now, if they had been thinking of the land they had left behind, back to Hebrews, they would have had the opportunity to return. Right? If, if Abraham felt like, this Canaan trip, that's not really working out. Sarah, let's pack up. Let's go back home. Because the life that we had back there was better than this one that we have here. In fact, during the Exodus, the children of God did cry out. And they said, you know, when we were slaves in Egypt, at least we had, we had meat to eat. We might have been slaves, but we weren't hungry. Now we're out here in this wilderness. We don't know where our next meal is coming from. And Moses, it's your fault. And Moses was like, God, help me with these people. Mm. Try leading the multitudes like Moses. It's a test of faith. But as they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Now, check this out. The anticipation of the afterlife is written all over these final verses of the Berkeley that we have in Hebrews today. But this text also stands as an inspiration for those of us who are seeking to season our present life with the flavor of God. I mean, it is one thing to, to long for the promise. As a matter of fact, I just, I just had a graveside yesterday and we were speaking about the promise, speaking about the promise of the life to come, not quite knowing how to define that, but trusting indeed that there is that life to come, which we shall inherit when our labors on earth are completed. But until that time comes to pass, We've got some living to do, which means the promise has to play out in us. The love, the understanding, the forgiveness, the forbearance, that has to happen now, right? Because we have the ability to taste the kingdom of God right now where we are at. If we so choose, if we attach ourselves to the promise, let then our actions and the condition of our minds and hearts direct us into that promise. No more holding grudges. No more trying to, to chain individuals. No more being stingy with our pardon and our absolution. 
allowing the love of God that passes in and through us to be conveyed through our daily activities. This is what it means to have renewed hope and unity. Also, this is what it means to take up the mantle that Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. So two final takeaways for today. First of all, we must attach ourselves to the promise of God. Right? I mean, because to come to worship is to hear the retelling of the great stories of faith. To think about where that intersects with our present life. And to think about how God is speaking to this present moment, whatever it is that you might be dealing with, whatever it is going on in your personal life, your health life, your family life, your children's lives. And to realize that God is speaking promises in through all of that. So this, first of all, is to attach ourselves to the promise of God and to never waver. And also, we must allow these promises that we anchor ourselves to, to move us forward. To not conceal that, but to allow people to experience the work of God through us, through our respective gifts, abilities, and presence. We will have more from Hebrews in the coming weeks, but this story of Abraham and Sarah is to get our minds thinking in that direction that individuals who get plugged in and trust the promises of God actually do yield an incredible inspiration for those generations. Let us join together in our response to hymn number 374.
Let us pray. As we gather here this morning, merciful God, we understand the concerns that are on our heart. Some of these concerns have even caused us to attend worship. Others are things that have been brewing in our minds, present circumstances, conditions. Things going on both on a personal note and on a wider scale. But it is true that our minds do think about things that are concerns to us. And there are some things that we can take action about. We can move forward on tasks that are in our control. But we thank you for the motivation that you give us. To first of all, to trust the promises that we hear from your scriptures. The gift of faith is one that we do not take for granted. It is by faith that we are able to advance our witnessing for you. It is by faith that we are able to wrap ourselves in the mystery without anxiety. But it's that forward motion that you provide to be able to live even without the reality of knowing what lies ahead, but still holding and trusting that you are with us, that you will make the connections, that things will turn out for the best. We thank you for the ability to hear your word and to respond to it to share your word, to be with others who are also in need, and to be able to speak hope into their circumstance. To be a part of a healing community. We thank you for every opportunity that you have had and that you have given us that we might be able to be part of bringing peace, conveying love and support to those in our immediate circles of influence, but also in our respective communities. We ask your blessing on those who are sick and suffering, those who are healing, pray for those who are in hospital, we pray for those who struggle with with addiction. We pray that you would allow us to be as informed as we can on a variety of ways that we might even help individuals that we know who are suffering. That we can bring resources that we can provide support, that we can direct and encourage. Help us to live out the promise of being your people in any way we can. We pray for those who are in mourning. We pray for the family of Alice Harris. We ask that you would continue to watch over her sons and their families. We gather here today with the hope of renewal. The hope that we, as people of faith, are being watched over. So I ask that you would 
receive the prayers of your people. And that you would hear the prayers that they would speak unto you in their hearts. That you would bless them, rejuvenate them, strengthen them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Receive these prayers spoken unto you, God, and remember us as we pray as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Lay your blessing on these gifts, loving God, and allow each and every one of us to continue to inhabit and to share that promise. We ask these things in your name. God, thank you. Your renewal, your promises, your motivation is exactly what we need. Lead us into this week that we too can hear and respond, both not only to you, but to your people. We join together in our closing hymn, number 413. God, gracious, loving, renewing God, guide you forward, enrich your days, 
crown you with a blessing, give you confidence to lean deeper and deeper into that promise. Go forward. Share the blessing.